as Dina and I were planning uh, today's sermon and uh, my approaching surgery uh, this past Wednesday, uh, we thought and were told that it was relatively minor surgery and recovery would be quite quick. Uh, what we didn't uh, plan on was that there were some cysts in my knee that took a little bit more work and stitches, etc. So the recovery is a little longer than we thought, and so therefore I'm on a bit more pain medication than we anticipated. So I'm not sure how wise it was to plan uh, me preaching a sermon when I'm uh, quite high on pain medication. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, I think it would have been much more appropriate with me hobbling around if I did the call for the offering. That probably would have gained more sympathy and the offering would have been probably larger. But here we go. This series during the season of Lent up until Easter Sunday is on scandalous Jesus. Too often the church presents Jesus as this warm, cuddly baby or the person whose death that we mourn and not enough attention is focused on the life of Jesus and what he really taught and what he really did. Why Jesus died is a question that's debated and, um, among theologians and others and kind of the traditional view of Christianity over the last thousand years or so has been a theory that we call substitutionary atonement which boils down to uh, a theory that Jesus had to die in order for God to forgive sins. And uh, many people in progressive Christianity, myself included, are questioning that and saying that doesn't resonate with what we think of a loving God, that somehow God needed someone to die to be happy again. Uh, and so we question that. And instead, many of us believe that uh, Jesus died because he stirred things up. He got the political leaders of his day so upset the fundamentalists of his day so upset that they colluded together and killed him. But that God decided they weren't going to have the last word and that God raised him from the dead. But it is obvious, whatever theory you believe, it is obvious that Jesus scandalized the political leaders and the fundamentalists of his day. He did a number of things that really upset them. And so what does that mean for us? For those of us who say we want to follow the example of Jesus, what does that mean for us in our lives today? So today we're not taking, taking a look so much on how Jesus scandalized things as we're taking a look at what does that mean, mean for us. Jesus didn't say to those disciples, come and worship me. Jesus said, come and follow me. It's not in sitting in the pew that we receive. It is in serving, in following, that we receive. The earliest followers of Jesus called their movement the way. The way we live our lives. With any way, you can either go forward or backward. And we don't want to go backwards. And as Diana Butler Bass said, we cannot go back. We should not want to go back. She also says, that Christianity as we have known it has failed. And that's clear from the trends in the Christian church. The decline of the Christian church is dramatic in most parts of the world. People are no longer finding the traditional message meaningful. And so, as has happened many times in the life of Christianity, it is one of those times for us to take a look at what are we doing, what are we saying, what are the questions that we're addressing, and are those really the questions that people are asking. Now, we can look back at our past to learn from it, but we should not look back at our past with such a sense of nostalgia that we want to go back there. So, she says, this warm, cuddly Christianity no longer meets people's needs. It no longer meets the needs of the world because it is not the transformative movement it once was. Christianity began as a movement to challenge the status quo, to challenge inequality, to challenge oppression. Yes, to care for people in need, but while caring for people, to challenge the world. Too often, Christianity has now become the comfortable pew, the place to come when you're in trouble to be comforted, and then to leave and come back when there's trouble again. It has become the bridge over troubled water that Christianity has been a lot of the time. And while that is important, and I hope that our church will always be a place where people will come in the midst of need, but it cannot replace being a bridge to a better future, 
being a bridge to a changed world. Sometimes this is talked about in terms of, is the church a hospital or a fitness center? Is it a hospital where people in trouble or hurting are cared for? Or is it a fitness center that is to get people in shape spiritually so they can go out and take on the world to make it a better place? I would say it's a bit of both. Unfortunately, it has been too much a hospital and not enough challenging people to be a part of a fitness center. Another way of looking at this is talking about followers versus fans. And I want to thank Dina for this amazing quote that she found from pastor and writer Kyle Eidelman. And he writes, My concern is that many of our churches have gone from being sanctuaries to becoming stadiums. And every week all the fans come to the stadium where they cheer for Jesus, but have no interest in truly following him. The biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians, but aren't really interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it really requires anything of them. And he entitles his book, Not a Fan, subtitled, But a Follower. The early Christian church in its first 1,200 years saw a very dramatic expansion around the world. And as historians uh, and theologians look back at that time, they tried to assess why did the church grow so dramatically. And what they believe is the church grew because it took on fundamentalists and freed people from them and gave them a spirituality without fundamentalism. That it grew because it took on the political oppressors. It grew because those early Christians were not afraid to tackle things. So if there was a major disease in, a, in an area, Christians were one of the first people to go in and help because they weren't afraid. They weren't afraid of death. They weren't afraid of political leaders. They weren't afraid of fundamentalists. At MCC Toronto, as we look over our history, we can see periods of time when we followed that best tradition of the Christian church, of being that place of transformation. We saw it around equal marriage. We see it today around our refugee program. And as we have done that, many people have seen the church at a distance and said, that's the kind of church I want to belong in. A church that's not just about personal beliefs, but it's also about social justice. The early church certainly was a place that cared for people. And it was a place that was involved in challenging injustices. Their motivation was not worshiping Jesus. Their motivation was working with Jesus to change the world. So, why follow the way of Jesus? When I talk to people who say they have a problem with Christianity or a problem with religion or a problem with the church, when I have an opportunity to sit down with them and dig deeper and ask some other questions, what I find out is that people don't have a problem, for instance, at MCC Toronto with the sermons. They may agree or disagree. They may like some points and not some other points. They may think, hey, that was a great point, or I can't agree with that. But really, it's not a major problem for people. What's a problem for people is not Jesus, but what the church has done with Jesus. It's not the life and teachings of Jesus that are a problem. It's the dogma and the rules that go around being part of a church community. So if people could follow Jesus without having to take the church, it would be very attractive for them. But as much as they want to follow Jesus or are attracted to this Jesus, Jesus said, hold on just a bit. Before you get so excited in getting involved in this movement, make sure you know what you're getting involved in. Just like with our new members we received today. People come and say, this is a great place, I want to be a member. We say, wonderful, but come to a membership class so you know what you're getting involved in. So you know what the requirements are, like volunteering, financial support, our membership covenant, etc. And so today's gospel reading, and this is the point that if those of you who watch your watches and time the length of sermons, I now begin my sermon at this point. <laughs> In today's gospel reading, there are three examples that Jesus gave where people wanted to follow him, but he first talked to them about the price they would have to pay. It sounds harsh. 
He even sounds snarky at times. He's certainly not making it easy on people who say they want to follow him. In today's language, we would say he's really raised the bar for those who want to follow. The first example. Someone said to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of humanity will have no place to lay his head. So I think what Jesus is saying is if you really want to follow me, this is going to be an insecure way. Following Jesus means being open to wherever it may lead you. It may not be so much about putting down roots as it, it is about being open to going places that you thought you would never go before. Going places physically that you thought you would never go before. Going places emotionally, sharing those emotions that maybe you've never shared with others or shared in any kind of group setting. Going places spiritually. Maybe you came here defining yourself as not religious, not Christian, not spiritual, but being open to redefining those and playing around the edges and maybe exploring some parts of spirituality that you would never have thought that you would have explored before. Now, I'm not saying that all of you will sell your houses and move across the country to go on some trip to do something new or start an MCC somewhere else. But maybe some of you will. Maybe that's where God will call you. Maybe you never saw yourself marching in a demonstration or signing a petition or calling a politician. But nay, maybe now you will. Maybe you never saw yourself as a spiritual person, but now you'll explore it. Maybe you never saw yourself in a support group for a new refugee or helping to build a youth program or a seniors program or facilitating a small group. Maybe now you will. Maybe you never saw yourself volunteering in a church after you retire or even working at a church. But maybe now you will. In this second example, Jesus said to another person, come and follow me. The man agreed, but first he said, let me go home and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the reign of God. Now this may sound really harsh. Why would Jesus say something like this? And for me, in terms of recently dealing with my mom's death, I don't think that Jesus was saying, you can't take time to go home and bury your family. Frankly, I'm not quite sure what he means. But my best guess is, and we practice best guess theology here at MCC Toronto, and we celebrate that. My best guess is that what Jesus is getting at here is that we can't be so obligated to honor the past, to bury what's dead, that we forget our calling. That Jesus is saying, it's time to remember that your calling, no matter what is happening to you, your calling is to offer hope and transformation to our world. That's always got to be your priority, even while you're burying the dead. Sometimes people grieve so much that they put their lives on hold. And I see that especially when relationships end, when there's an abrupt end of a relationship. People will get so stuck in the grief of that relationship, they refuse to love again. They refuse to live their lives again. They refuse to see the people and the support that's still around them, the opportunities that are there. And most concerning, most concerning, they refuse to see themselves as blessed no matter what we lose, still seeing ourselves as blessed, focusing on who remains, what remains, and living our lives out of gratitude. Yes, grieve, but for God's sake, move on. For your own sake, move on. For the sake of the world that needs you, move on. Jesus is saying that it is our duty to proclaim this new realm of God, this realm of God that we are to be an ambassador for, this realm of God that talks to us about grieving, yes, but remembering to proclaim good news. 
And thirdly, another person said, yes, I will follow you, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the dominion of God. Now this is not about death or grieving. It's about attachment. And sometimes our attachments can hold us back. We all know how destructive it can be in a relationship if your current partner continually compares yourself to their previous partner. If they get stuck on how great that person was, they might not recognize the value that you bring. Now one of the advantages that John and I have of being in a relationship for 33 years is that we've both forgotten all of our previous partners. <laughs> and so we don't compare because we've forgotten them. But this attachment to the, to the past we see played out in church when people want to hold on to their old denominational ways, their own ways of worshiping, their old music. Jesus said it's about the proclaiming the realm of God. It's about focusing on this vision for a better world. And moving towards that vision will help us to go forward in a straight path. That it's the vision that propels us, not the past. What is that vision? It's the vision of a world based on love and compassion, justice and forgiveness, equality and liberation. And what would it look like if someone was really able to live into that kind of a vision? I think it would look like Jesus. I think his life and his teachings give us an example of what it would be like to live that passionately and that consistently out of love and justice. Jesus said to those early disciples, come and follow me and I will involve you in an eternal endeavor that will change you forever and that will change the world forever. Are you willing to follow this Jesus? Confident that the life that you will build and that the world that you will transform will be exactly the life and exactly the world that God has entrusted to your care. I'm sure those early disciples could never have imagined what was in store for them. And while it may have ended in martyrdom for some of them, I bet that they would not regret their decision. Indeed, that they'd do it all over again. Take on injustice. Take on fundamentalism. Provide a positive, progressive spirituality. Challenge the political injustices and equalities of our day. I bet they would do it all over again. But they can't. But we can. Will you? Amen.